Hello, and welcome to Deep, a series with Don Richardson. Today's focus is on the question, who wins in the end? Don, uh, if they haven't seen any of our previous focus teachings, I want to openly say thank you. Your teaching has changed my life. Your top line, bottom line teaching that you poured into me 15 years ago, I have turned around and not only taught, but poured into others who have poured into others. It's being taught in China, Philippines, really all over the globe as the Ministry of Unveiling Glory has expanded. Bob, all over the world as I've traveled, I've met people who credit you with having brought that teaching. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but we are looking at the question of yes. who wins. I yes. think this is a very pertinent question because some people are wondering, is it all worth it? Yes. Is this all worth are we gonna are we gonna get to heaven and find out we made it, but there's more people in hell? Look how few there are here compared to how many there are down there. Yeah, I mean just in this community, in this town, and, and we're a Christian nation. Yes. And there are so few who truly claim Christ as Lord, it really makes you want to scratch your head and say, is it all worth it? Are we really on the winning team? I mean, I know we are. Yes. Uh, God wins in the end, but what kind of a victory is it? There are two kinds of victory. There's the qualitative victory, otherwise known as the moral victory, and the quantitative victory, which has to do with numbers, percentages, on one side or the other. Talk about the moral victory. What do you mean by that? We all know that at the cross, God, through His Son sacrificing Himself, won the moral victory over the evil one. Question is, is God content only to win the moral victory? That is to say, the quality, the victory of quality over the evil one. Meaning we're holy, yes. we're without sin, we get to be with God. That's the moral victory. Yes, and God's holiness is vindicated by Christ dying to atone for our sin. Is God content with that victory only, or is He also, by His power, His sovereignty, His wisdom, setting out in history to win the quantitative victory over the evil one by seeing to it that more people created in His image will end up in heaven than will end up lost. So we're talking about two victories, a qualitative victory, the moral victory, we're holy, yes. and a quantitative victory, will there be in the end more people in heaven or more people in hell? Yes, and I think that many Christians if asked, what percentage of mankind, thinking not just of part of mankind, but all of mankind from Adam and Eve all over the world until now? And even from conception? Yes, from conception to maturity. What percentage of all these billions of people created in God's image will end up as citizens with God in His eternal kingdom? And what percentage will end up banished from God because of a failure to repent and believe on Him, what percentage of them will be in, with God or away from God? I think many Christians would say 3% will end up in heaven. Some would say 5%. And of course, very liberal people might say... 15, 20. Oh, yes. So we're going to seek today to find a biblically based answer, not that we will end up knowing any precise percentages, but we want to see if there are parameters indicated in the Word of God which show whether God wins the, qual the quantitative victory in addition to the moral victory. We know He's one. already won the qualitative victory. That's right. So That's what's the question is the quantitative victory. Yes. Now, Don, we uh, want to ask you a question. Uh, we've done it in the other topics that we've looked at and the other focuses that we've addressed. I, it's probably more pertinent in those, but I also want to address it in this one. How did you learn to study the Bible? Because how you learned has affected everything in many ways that you are teaching on. Yes. When I was being trained in the Word of God, I was trained to study the Word of God, and if there was a statement in a verse of Scripture that wasn't clear to me, before going to commentary to see what theologians commentary writers had to say about it, look through the Word of God to see if I could find anything else somewhere else in the Old and New Testament that shed light upon this particular question 
that I had no answer for. That hallelujah for the treasury of Scripture knowledge. Allowing Scripture to interpret Scripture. Yes. And after I'd done that kind of examination and come to a conclusion, then I would go to the commentaries to see if the commentators found the same conclusion I did. And often they did. And sometimes I found they had a better conclusion than I did. So then I could make an adjustment because they would bring still more scriptures I hadn't even thought to look at. So it's not that it's wrong to read commentaries on the Bible, but it's best to start off by trying to find answers to questions from a scripture illumined scripture. That's how I began. Don, this is, uh, that's so pertinent today because a lot of people, they go straight to their footnotes or internet, but that's not what you could do. Not back then. And not what we should be doing now, but we should be looking scripture against scripture, see how they compare, and they have to agree with each other. Yeah, and after that, resorting to commentaries. Right. Yes. Okay, we're going to make two assumptions in looking at who wins, and that's assuming that they've done our other focus. Yes. The focus of does general revelation lead to salvation, and does man have a free will? Yes. But I want to review some of that for people just in case they pick this one up and said, oh, this looks great, and they've never studied it. They've got to get some foundation. So I'm eager to hear your review of what oh. we covered. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm going to go over one key passage that yes. you went over, Psalm chapter 50. Yes. And so I'm going to read it. It goes like this. The mighty one, God, the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. Now, just from verse 1, God is calling mankind to himself, not yes. just the Hebrews, mm -hmm. all of humanity from the rising to the setting of the sun. It's a very comprehensive statement. Yeah, yes. verse 2. From Zion, perfect in beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and will not be silent. A fire devours before him, and around him a tempest rages. He summons the heaven above and the earth that he may judge his people. Okay, so here in verse 4, God's saying, I'm, I'm going to judge people. We all know there's a judgment day, mm -hmm. and God is judging all of humanity. Yes. But what does he pull in for his witness? What does he pull in for his testimonies? You would expect he might say he summons the law and the prophets to be witnesses for or against the people that are being judged. But instead, he summons the heavens above and the earth beneath. That's what we call general yes. revelation, Psalm so the, 19. These 1. people are being judged according to their response to or indifference to the witness of, the, of God through and, the heavens and the earth. And from all of my teaching, Romans 1 and 2 says they are guilty. Yes. No possibility of anyone having responded positively and being sealed as a citizen of God's kingdom on the basis of Christ's sacrifice, but in a retroactive way through general revelation. And so I would assume verse 5 would say, and because of their witness, they all have been separated from God eternally. Forever. That's not what it says. It's not what it says. Verse 5. Surprising ending to the verse. Gather to me my consecrated ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Yes. My consecrated ones. Consecrated means set apart for God. Yes. So God, through general revelation, have those he calls his own. Mm -hmm. They've never had someone come with them and share with them about Christ. They've never had a special revelation of the prophets, the law. They came to know God through the witness of nature. On the basis of Christ's sacrifice, but it's the witness of nature that brought them to the point of offering a kind of sacrifice. Uh, which indicates a repentant spirit, a dependent spirit on God. And through that, the faith that was part and parcel of that sacrifice they offered, they became God's consecrated ones. And then in this judgment, they are gathered to God. And what excited me when we did that study was the, the fact that 95% of all languages have a word for the uncreated creator. Yes. So if they call out to the uncreated creator in sincerity and beseech him for mercy, God says they're my consecrated Even ones. Even secular scholars acknowledge the fact that there's everywhere you go in the world, there's at least the inkling of one singular uncreated creator. They call it native monotheism. Mm. 
So exciting. Yeah. Now in that focus, we also looked at many passages that go against the idea that general revelation can lead one into salvation. Yes. We looked at Acts chapter 10 and 11, Peter and Cornelius. We looked at Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no other name. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Romans 1 and 2, all are guilty because of general revelation. Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. Romans 10, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Yes. Every one of those passages we addressed and showed this is scripture against scripture, the way you learned, there are answers to every one of them. General revelation can lead to salvation through Jesus, Yes, only through Him. Jesus incognito. Exactly. There's only one way to God and it's through Jesus, through His blood sacrifice to atone for the sin of the world. But these people who have never heard His name are still saved by Him just because they respond to God to the extent they pray, they offer a sacrifice. God sees it, recognizes it. As we read elsewhere, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are perfect toward him. Mm, amen. We then looked at, in our second focus, does man have a free will? Yes. And how does that work with the sovereignty of God? It wasn't the free will versus the sovereignty of God as if they were against each other. It was the free will and, and the, the sovereignty, sovereignty of God. Yes. And so we began to look at Ephesians 2.1, and we said man is dead in their sins. But we said that word dead in the original Greek has three connotations. Separation, the body and the soul. Cessation of function, our heart stops, our, 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 we quit breathing, uh, our nerves quit sending signals, yes. and a decay begins. Yes. And the original man who studied that passage, Augustine of Hippo, focused only on one of those aspects, yes. cessation of function. Yes. Hence, as a result, <laughs> no man can come to God. No man can do any, man can't even will to want to know God. Hence, man has no free will. The cessation of any spiritual capacity, analogous to the cessation of physical functions when a body dies. That's how we interpret it. Paul's idiomatic use of the Greek word nekros. And so we said, no, it's just a separation. We looked at the prodigal son, different words of the different uses of the word nekros in the New Testament and say, it can be the separation. Man can have a free will. Then we looked at John 6, 44. Yes. No one can come to me unless the Father draws him. In that drawing, we found there were two types of drawing. An irresistible drawing, I am, my glasses have no option, but I am drawing them to myself. We're irresistibly drawn by the force of gravity toward the center of the earth. But there is a resistible drawing. When yes. I call my dog, my dog has a choice to come or not to come. Mm -hmm. When you try to court a woman and draw her close to you, she could say, I like what you're doing, or she could say, no way, Jose, mm -hmm. I don't want you. And so there's two types of drawings that God can do to us. In that, we looked at God's foreknowledge. And we gave a definition to God's foreknowledge. God, as he looks into the future and sees what options there are for us of what he could do, we call them foreknown effectual persuasions, yes. circumstances that God could arrange in our lives that could draw us to himself. And we define foreknowledge as this. It is not just that God foreknows that a certain person will exist at a certain time and place. But God also foreknows how that person will utilize the gift of free will in the midst of any possible set of circumstances he may find himself in over the course of his life. In the midst of this, God foreknows that there is a moment or a way or time and a place where God can persuade the sinner to repent. So God knows all the possible future events that could come into our lives and knows how to arrange persuasions that will draw us to himself. We use the analogy of my wife. When my children were holding on to something that wasn't good for them, that could possibly hurt them, she, but they're holding on to it firmly, you can't grab it away and their will wouldn't <clears throat> let them let you take it away. She had the option to just yank it out of their hands. And she right? didn't do that, no. she was wise. She held something else that they wanted. And they said, oh, I want that. They dropped what was bad and they grabbed what was good. Something they wanted even more. An analogy that we use of how God yes. works with us. We then also said we're saved by grace. Yes. And we define grace very specifically as being this. 
God saw that some sinners could be persuaded, and God, in His wisdom, arranges the persuasion so at just the right moment in their lives, they find themselves surrounded by those persuasions, they are persuaded, and repent. When they repent, they are repenting on their own and are putting their faith in God, but only in response to persuasions that God sovereignly provided. Though they have the capacity in their free will to reject God's persuasions, God already foreknows they won't reject Him, and on that basis provides them. Now, Don, all of this depends on whether Augustine's interpretation of the word necros is accurate. Yes, because if he was right that the use of word, the word necros, which means dead, meant that the sinner is totally devoid of any spiritual capacity or function, then the sinner surrounded by any set of persuasions wouldn't be able to repent. They can't, they're dead. But as surely as the meaning Paul intended when he used necros idiomatically in passages like Ephesians 2.1 meant simply separation from God without cessation of function, the sinner surrounded by those foreknown effective persuasions is able to say yes to them. Mm. And God foreknows that yes and makes sure the right persuasions are there at the foreknown right moment. Now, Don, with man having a free will, it redefines love. It does. And helps you understand love in such a better way. Give us your definition of it. Why did God want man to have a free will so that that love would be so full and rich? If man <clears throat> does not have the option not to love, then can the love he gives really be defined as love? In other words, if God <clears throat> made us a bunch of robots to love him, and the robot has no option to not love him, yes. that love is not really love. Every parent who loves his or her child does have an option not to. And there are some people that exercise the option not to love. So the the, the option not to love is what gives the choice to love, love's great value. And so God wanting to have that quality of love yes. created a creation with free will so that that love would be rich and full. The love of robots would not satisfy him. He wants love from people who have the option not to love him but choose to love him. That is what gives love its special meaning for God as it does for us. Without free will, you really can't have love. There has to be the option not to love for love to have its greatest value. Now, Don, we also looked in our previous study on graphing humanity and their resistance or their uh, easeability of coming to know yeah. God, and we did a graph. Yeah. Let's explain that graph. You got point A and point B. Point A at the top represents the highest level of stubbornness that a fallen sinner is capable of putting up against God's persuasions. B is the lowest level. In other words, anyone who sets his threshold of submission close to point B is an easily persuaded sinner. So from A to B, 100% of humanity is are in represented. there. Represented. Every represented person there. on earth who, uh, every person on earth is somewhere on that line. The more stubborn a person is, the higher on the line. The more persuadable, the person is the lower on the line. Okay, now we talked about BC type people. These are the easily persuaded. Yes, these we define as the people in the world confronted with the witness of God through general revelation are impressed by it. And they respond, they pray to the Creator God. These are those people that became the consecrated ones that offer a sacrifice to God. No matter where they are in the world, they do that, God sees it and receives them as his dedicated ones. They're apparently a very small minority of mankind. They're the Jobs, the Melchizedeks. Yes. They responded to general revelation. We then went and talked about the um, CD people, those where special revelation is needed. Yes, the CD people are people whose thresholds of submission cannot be reached by the witness of general revelation alone but they're open to a stronger persuasion if it could be added to the already present witness of the heavens and the earth. So someone telling them about the Lord, someone showing them love, reaching out to them in a hard time, they say, you're really ministering to me. I want to know your God. And they understand 
that Jesus died to atone for their sins. They hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that witness added to the already present witness of the heavens and the earth brings them to their threshold of submission, and they pray to be saved. Now, we then talked about the A.D. people. Those are the finally impenitent. Talk about those. They are the people who, of their own free choice, set their thresholds of submission so high on the scale that when God does the equivalent of a computer scan to see if there's any kind of situation he could arrange to place them in so that they would be brought to their threshold of submission and pray to him, nothing works. Anything that God could arrange in the context of this world, which is a finite arena, is not going to be effective. They set their thresholds of submission beyond the reach of His mercy, His persuasions. So they are the non-elect on the basis of God's foreknowledge of their placing their thresholds of submission beyond the reach of earthly persuasions. And that placing their threshold of submission is just their free will. It's yes. just... I don't want to bow before you. It's they're hard-headed. Yeah. They're, they're the pharaohs, uh, the pharaoh yes, types. That's right. The okay. finally impenitent. <clears throat> no persuasion will work for them. They reject everything. Mm -hmm. So all of this so far has been review. We needed to do this review yeah. uh, to help lay the foundation if someone jumped into this focus without having seen the other two. We wanted them to understand this.